right. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, cool. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ben Shreves, and today I'll be talking to you guys about this historic diet determination through seed identification. Uh, that's kind of a boring title. Um, hopefully, the presentation is the better. Um, a little quick outline about today. Uh, I'm going to give you guys just a quick about me. I think that's important so you understand why I'm here talking to you. Uh, I'll give you a little background on the project itself. Talk to you about what I did and how I did it. And then finally, the, the meat and potatoes, uh, what I found. What I found. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, a little bit about me first. Uh, I am finalizing a master's degree of integrative genomics at Blackfield State University. Um, I'm focusing mainly on plant ecology and phylogenetics. Uh, I've worked as a seed collector for as a contract worker for the National Parks, where I collect native seeds for restoration efforts. Uh, I was an interpreter park ranger down here at Wind Cave for a number of seasons. Um, I've worked as a teaching and research assistant at a lot of the, local, the state schools, USC, SCSU, Blackwell State, mostly with uh, plant related to plants. <laughs> And uh, I've also worked at Jolly Lane Greenhouse in Rapid City as a perennial department lead, and I've been a naturalist in a number of different ways. So really what I'm trying to warn you is that today is actually more <laughs> about plant ecology uh, and plants, um, and with history also is like, sorry, I'm saying this wrong. What I'm trying to say is, there we go, is that I'm also currently a professor. Uh, my first day, my first class starts on Monday. Uh, I'm trying to finalize my thesis. And so unfortunately, this presentation might not be as put together as I want it to be, uh, but I hope you guys enjoy it, and um, I will. I am a huge lover of the prairie and of plants, and so I know I'm the last one of the day. So you see a lot of plants throughout, just trying to sparkle it up a little bit. <laughs> so, project background. So, why am I here talking to you guys? Well, initially, back in 2001, uh, there's some construction going over on at 40 Taylor Avenue, in Deadwood, South Dakota. It's in the southern tip of where Chinatown used to be uh, in Deadwood. And it's right next to the Mount Moria Cemetery, which is where Wild Bill Hickok, among a number of other famous Deadwood celebrities, are buried. Uh, and during the construction, they unearthed an ancient privet, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Uh, and a large number of archaeological uh, remains were discovered from that dig, including this serving dish that was actually pieced back together by the Deadwood Historical Society. Um, so it was a very pretty cool, interesting find. And then they believe that the privet belonged to an Albert W. Merrick. He's the proposed owner of this privy. He established the Black Hills Pioneer back in 1976. And that uh, newspaper is actually still in print to this day. It's one of the longest running papers in the Black Hills region. Uh, it's believed that he passed away in 1902, and he's buried in that same cemetery where the privy was unearthed. And so that means the seeds that I worked with during this project are roughly 120 to 145 years old, which is kind of cool to think that they've been able to survive for that long. Uh, and so basically what happened was there's a bunch of soil samples that were unearthed, uh, or just, uh, uncovered along with other archaeological remains. Uh, and within that soil, there was believed to be a lot of uh, excuse me, seeds, as well as a bunch of bottles full of soil and seeds. And so the aim of this project then was to basically separate those seeds from the soil, identify what they were, and then identify what species they were in terms of trying to figure out essentially what the diet of people back in the late 1800s and Deadwood was. Yes. <laughs> I think you can put two and two together. <laughs> and so how did I do this? Well, we had a bunch of soil samples from the dig itself. Uh, we had the homogenized, it was all mixed together, and we seed them, separate them by part of the size. So there were four seed sizes, two millimeters, one millimeter, 0.75, 0.5 millimeters. And then within the bottles themselves, um, they were basically flooded and all of the particulate matter that rose to the top was collected, dried, and put into it in its own separate bag. So we had five bags of materials. They were basically uh, organized by sieve size and then floated, uh, with bag one being the biggest sieve size, bag four being the smallest sieve size, and bag five being the floated material. So then Nike got to work, um, went through, and basically, little by little, uh, went through those bags of soil on the particle matter. Um, I used steel forceps. I would take basically a subsample of soil sample from the bag. I'd sort through it with forceps and basically collect seeds and then group them based on morphological uh, similarities, so how they looked, did they have similar traits. Um, I used a variety of magnification types. Um, some of the seeds, some of the details, and the seeds are small as it is, and in order in terms of 
making sure they look the same, do some really fine detail. So use a variety of magnification mag 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 lenses. Um, and then again, use forceps to, to for separate the seeds themselves. For some of the very like more delicate seeds, actually use a fine detailed paintbrush to avoid causing any damage, essentially. Took a while. <laughs> um, so once I had all the seeds sorted by book, by, then I went had to basically go through and figure out what these seeds were. Um, to, to do so, luckily at the time I was working at the Blackwood State University Herbarium, which had a number of resources for me to use, which is very lucky for me. Um, I used reference books, taxonomic keys, which are basically um, choose your own adventure, but the adventure's kind of already planned out for you. And then a bunch of uh, a variety of scientific literature um, to try and figure out what these seeds were, which again, I had plenty of access to at the Herbarium, which is nice. I used a variety of different microscopes. Um, however, I did collect a number of photos of the seeds themselves using a digital microscope, and that was 250X. So the seeds that you see today are 250 times their actual size. And then I used a phone camera just to detail my, my work. Very cool. Okay, so here we go. The phone camera. So I am going to talk a little bit about the ecology of these um, species, the, the seeds themselves, because I think it's important to know the ecology and understand the historic use of them. Uh, a couple of things to note, the species that I have to present the species, it's in order of abundance, so how often they were found. So the first species I, I present will be the most common seed that I found, and the last species will be the least common. And then there's a lot of other material that was in the soil samples. There's charcoal and like glass and bone fragments, which is, it tells our own story, but it wasn't what I was being paid for, so I don't get to tell that story, unfortunately. <laughs> so, the very first species, that, the most common seed that was in that soil, was red raspberry, Rubus idaeus. It's a member of the rosaceae family, so the rose family. Actually, most fruits that we eat are in the rose family, surprisingly enough. I was able to identify the seed because it had these very dis defined, distinct, ridged margins around the seed itself. Um, the surfaces were regulose, regulose to aviolate, so what that means is that regulose is just kind of rugged, like rolling hills, to aviolate, which means like pitted, deep pits, which you can kind of see in the photos themselves. Uh, and kind of bleakly elliptic in shape. So this species is native. It's very common throughout the hills. I'm sure you've seen it if you've ever been outside in the summer. Um, mainly though in mid to high elevations, which Lee Deadwood definitely is in that category. Um, the fruit itself, fruits from July to August, so it's a long time that the fruit is available. And not only that, but it holds, it holds, hangs onto the plant for a long time. It's also an aggregate fruit. And what that means is that when you eat a raspberry, you're getting more than just one fruit. You're getting a collection of small fruitlets, right? That make up one big fruit, you guys see that. And so each of those little like, bumps is basically an individual fruit that's combined together to make one big fruit. And each of those individual small fruits, fruitlets, have a seed inside of them. So when you eat one raspberry, you're actually eating tens to hundreds of seeds at once, which is kind of cool to think about. And ecologically, that's actually an adaption, because that's how, basically, it doesn't take a lot of energy to produce those seeds. Right. And so it's kind of a numbers game, where the raspberries are basically making these seeds to be eaten, and they're making a lot of those seeds, and probably 99% of them won't make it home, they won't, they won't germinate. But if you have hundreds and hundreds of seeds, and only 1% of them do survive, that's still tens to hundreds of new individual plants. And it will be important later. The second most important, or the second most common species, of seed that I found was Frigeria virginiana, a wild strawberry. So far, nothing too crazy, right? Uh, it's a very common plant in the Black Hills, also a member of the rose family. It is a, a keen fruit. So these fruits are only about, say these seeds are only about a millimeter, two millimeters in size. And that's the same uh, with the raspberry crop, I mentioned that. Um, obliquely ovate, they have to kind of Ovate shape, and they have a very, very like kind of a, the, the tip is, is an acute tip, and then the, the actual shell of the seed itself is smooth to reticulate, which just means it has a very fine like, look like. Um, it is native, this plant itself, again, native, very common in black hills, very uh, common to like moisten, it's a little bit of like, a little bit of water. So you'll find this a lot in like, moist meadows, open pine forests, uh, which again, that would need in the perfect area for this plant. Um, this was actually the strawberries that we know and love today. They're actually uh, basically babies of this plant. The wild strawberries are much smaller than the grocery store strawberries, but they, I think, have a lot more taste. With the black corn size, they make a full taste. If you ever find one in the wild, I definitely recommend to try. Um, and what's also, what was most nice is that they just 
the recorded history of use from indigenous peoples to pioneers. And so in terms of identification, that made my job a lot easier. It is also an aggregate fruit. So again, it has hundreds of, tens of hundreds of seeds on each individual strawberry, which means that it could leave a lot behind. The third most common was Vitus riparia, or river bait grape. Uh, this is actually in a different family called the Vitaceae family, which is just the grape family. Uh, the grape family is famous for having this pear ventral infold and a dorsal chalazum knot on the back of the seed itself. So you have these two little uh, divots and this little knot. So once I saw that, I knew it was in the grape family. However, this species in particular, so Vitus, so the river bait grape in particular, is famous for having sulcus, which is basically just a little valley that sits in the bottom of the seed that connects to the knot. And so this one was a pretty easy identification. Um, about five millimeters in size, a little bit bigger than the other two, about five times as big, and uh, kind of like a balloon shaped, essentially. I'm gonna get native. Widely distributed in the Black Hills, but it prefers a lot of wetter habitats. So whereas the other two, you'll find them in um, somewhat wet habitats, this one likes to be like, by streams and drainages in the area with a lot of water. Um, and again, historically recorded use. You can see uh, there's a lot of recorded history in terms of the use, in terms of indigenous peoples and pioneers. Uh, the quotas today even will dry out their graves themselves and use them as winter sustenance. Okay, so in the fourth most common was this beautiful guy named Physalis virginiana, also known as brown cherry. It's in the Solanaceae family, which is the potato tomato family, so it's not rose. And if you guys look here, it's a representation. So they, this is their flowers. They become these little husks eventually, and inside the husk are the fruits themselves. Kind of cool. Here's their head of tomatillo, um, very similar. Uh, the sweeter guy. Okay, so then for the seed itself, very strongly curved embryo, right? So with a depressed helm, so it's basically a depressed belly button, and that's where what this is right here, basically where the young, the young bill report used to, used to connect. Um, it's a flat shape, and it's reniform appearance, which means reniform, kidney-shaped, and then it has reticulated aerial on the surface. So again, net, net lines like very um, good. Again, another native species. So far, the most common seeds are all native, which is interesting to think about. Um, this one, though, is not super common. It's only occasional at low to mid elevations, and so in like the drier habitats, so like more mixed grass prairie, um, dry meadows, um, open pine forests. It's natural. There's only three species of ground cherry that are native to South Dakota. However, there are a number of horticultural varieties. And to this day, um, there are actually, it's kind of grown as a garden plant in some farms and gardens. And so this is actually the only species where I wasn't 100% certain about the identification. I'm positive that it's a Vaisalos, but it's, I'm not confident that it was the native variety. Could have been someone's, uh, sort of, someone could have been growing their own, essentially. So that's hard to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the fifth most common was cannabis sativa, also known as marijuana or hemp. It's an introduced species. Um, in terms of identifying the seed itself, you, uh, you get the same type of seed itself. It's an akeen, then obvious abscission zone. So basically, it's an area where the See, so will break off from the plant. You can see that here. And here. This is from a paper that talks about just um, basically natural cannabis sativa and more like human derived plants and how the seed have changed over time as humans have been feared. So, this is kind of a historic look, historic look of the seed. And this is kind of like the, the new modern day look of the cannabis seed. And so, this is what you kind of see here is kind of like an in between of the two. Um, it's Three to four millimeters in size, elliptic in cross section, and it ranges in color from green to black in the model. Um, it is introduced, it's the very first introduced species. Um, it is native to Asia initially. Globally, though, it's been cultivated since prehistory, since recorded time. Um, so it has a very long history with this plant. It prefers more mesic habitats, again, so like more wet, wet habitats, stream banks, uh, but it also likes disturbance, so you see a lot, a lot of times in uh, ditches or, or roadsides. Historically, it's been used for many things such as animal feed, rope, uh, oil vesicle, paint, but most often it's ingested for the physiological effects. Um, and it, because of that, it has a passing current controversial issue, 
as a current, current controversial issues about Cuba. And last but not least was peach, Prunus persica, also in the rose family. This is an introduced species, it's not native to South Dakota. Um, it's fairly, it's fairly easy to be identified. Uh, the pit itself is pretty, pretty well known. Um, but the it has the pericarps, they've got the outer, outer shell that we know as the pit, has an apiculate apex, so it's a very sharp tip there at the very top. It's covered and transferred with like, uh, furrows that go left and right, up and down, and it's punctuated across the surface by grooves and pits. So, peach pit. Um, introduced again, first domesticated in China though, and we thought to believe domesticated back in the Neolithic era, so back to like 7000 to 1700 BC, so a long time ago. Uh, the pit itself is actually designed to aid the embryo inside the pit against digestion. So, it's, because again, these fruits are designed to be eaten, they travel through the digestive system. And then they get pooped out somewhere, essentially, and we're hopefully it's a new home. Um, most of the seeds that we've seen so far, they're all designed that way. Um, however, I give the, the raspberry and the strawberry, obviously, less energy and time went into making those seeds, whereas this one, a lot of time and energy goes into making the pit, right? And so the idea here is that it's going to survive the digestion, the digestional trap, but also not only that, once it finds a, a new resting place for that embryo to develop and to germinate, as that pit biodegrades, and all the nutrients are released back into the soil. It's supposed to help the plant basically uh, grow. So it's basically um, a placenta in a certain way. Kind of cool. Um, as this plant was first, the tree itself was introduced to California. So it's hard to find any real literature about peaches in South Dakota back in the late 1800s, surprisingly. Um, but I was able to uh, find that this tree was in California as early as 1695, and that California was already kind of growing it as a crop and distributing it as a crop as early as 1858. And so by 1890s, it's definitely plausible that you find peaches in South Dakota. However, probably not as abundantly as you can nowadays, right? And so just a couple inventories and some final interpretations of what it means. So I talked a lot about the ecology. Um, I went through and counted all the seeds that I um, basically isolated. One thing to know though, the seed counts can, or more precise estimates, and part of that too is the seed stems are kind of broken. So how do you count that? Um, the seeds are very small, so it's hard to count them. And then also, if you have only a thousand small broken seeds, it's hard to get an, an exact uh, number. Uh, so just give me some cover some slack there. But the highest seed abundance and diversity, so in bags two and five. So in seed, that was one to two millimeters in size for particles. We found the most diversity of seeds and the most abundance. And that makes sense. There's a lot of raspberry seeds, a lot of strawberry seeds, are roughly a millimeter in size. And so in bag two, when the sieve was one millimeter, you found a lot of strawberry and a lot of raspberry seeds, and a lot of them. I think I had in bag two, I had 1,700 or 1,600 roughly raspberry seeds, and 500 strawberry seeds alone. And then in bag five, which was the floated material, um, so with all, basically all the bottles, we floated all the seeds to the top, that also had a lot of diversity, um, though maybe not so much abundance. So I did combine all the bags, so this is like a bind just for the species themselves. So in terms of seed number, cannabis, there's only eight seeds. So even though it was present, it wasn't very present, um, which indicates that it could have been used by Albert or could have been used by some kind of guest, essentially. There was only one peach pit, that was it, which also kind of indicates that peaches were not very common in South Dakota at the time. Definitely available. But maybe not a staple of the diet, more of a uh, exotic treat, right? Um, strawberry had a thousand seeds, and raspberry had three point five thousand seeds, and so that you know on surface value that seemed that would that would say that strawberries and raspberries were actually a pretty staple diet to the pioneers back in the late eighteen hundreds, nineteen hundreds, eighteen hundreds, and definitely, excuse me. One thing to keep in mind though is that they, again they are aggregates. Each fruit of a raspberry will have tens to hundreds of seeds on the fruit itself. And not all of them will survive. They're very small seeds. But these numbers could be inflated just due to that fact, if that makes sense. And so it's hard to really say that raspberries and strawberries were how, how you can't really quantify how much of the diet, how important the diet they were. But we can, but we can say they were important. Excuse me. Um, ground cherry, there's only 113, so again, it was not a very common plant, it's probably more like, as they found it, um, when it was out hiking, or it's out in nature, 
um, there's more pick and find kind of thing. Uh, in Great Head 228, um, kind of similar idea, we're not, not nearly as abundant, though, so probably not as stable of the diet, excuse me. What's interesting though is that most of the seeds I found were native. Um, and the only one that was on was peach, and the only one, right? And so what that means is that these pioneers back in the 19, 1800s, like, were definitely, just, like, had a lot of diet that revolved around what was available to them to definitely look up the land. And it's kind of fun to see some, like, proof of that fact. So that's it for now. <laughs> Special thanks to Dr. Mark Abel and the Blackfoot State University Aquarium uh, for all the resources they provided for me. Michael Rungi uh, in the Devon Historic Preservation Office for allowing me to be a part of this project. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Did you all cover any tomato seeds? What was that? Tomato seeds. Uh, the question was, do you that I have covered any tomato seeds? So Pisalis is in the tomato family. So like ground cherry is in that same family. Um, but the tomato seeds themselves, it was like what they were not tomato seeds. So like same family. Um, but no, I guess is my, is my answer. So my, my, I guess my question then though is like, did the seed, so the ground trees that I found, that I found were the, the native variety, the stuff that you can find in the hills, or was it something that, because there are horticultural, like there are people who just grow herb ground cherries basically. So that's where I, I don't have a good answer for you, I guess. That's, yeah, so you can absolutely do that. So the peach pit actually has two ovaries, so it can develop two baby plants, two embryos, basically. And so what you're eating is just the embryo, essentially. Um, the peach pit itself, so the hard outlining, I wouldn't recommend you do that. <laughs> but what you're eating is just basically a very small peach tree, if that makes sense. Kind of cool. <laughs> Was it tasty at all? Yeah. Okay, cool. Did it taste like a peach? No. <laughs> An almond? I can see that. Because so, was it kind of white? Yeah, yeah so that's, that's called the endocarp. And basically, that, that is kind of like the placenta that surrounds the baby tree itself. And so you're basically eating the nutrients that's supposed to support the tree as it grows. Yeah, at least it grows. Yes? Any of these uh, seeds, uh, were they, are they able to germinate? That's a good question. The ones that I have, no. The reason being, <laughs> It's because they were located from an old privy, and so they were bleached first. <laughs> they were chemically treated, basically, to make sure that there wasn't any nasty bacteria or anything that, that they had to come to contact with. And so at this point, because of that, they probably would not be able to germinate. That's a good question, though. I think um, a lot of seeds, especially some like the peach pit, or the you know, peach seed, yes, there's been documented evidence that native seeds, or just seeds in general, can survive for decades, if not centuries, in the soil. Um, so this is a chance where Given the proper conditions, they might have been able to, but that's too much to tell, unfortunately. Next. So, is anything growing out of this privy? Oh, uh, that's a good question, and one I don't know the answer for. I'm sorry. In terms of, because it was unearthed, it was under under a bunch of soil. So, there are probably things on top of it, but beyond that, that's yeah. I, mean, I wasn't there for the actual dig, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Behind her. Did you have a question, Janet? Well, my questions are about a timeline. Of the privy, mm -hmm. how long it had, had it not been used, obviously, mm -hmm. and when did you do the dig? Gotcha. So the, the dig was in 2001. Um, privy was used up until uh, there's a fire that burned down in Chinatown. Um, I, can't, I don't remember what year that was. I'll have to look it up and get back to you if you, if you want to well, wait. Just give me what hundreds it is. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so the privy itself was probably, I mean, it was being used from the late 18, like 1870s. And so, and then probably up until 1920s-ish, I would guess. Okay. So, so Merrick, the guy who owned it, died in 1902. Wow. So I mean, so it's, it's kind of that thing where it's like, was it just, I, I doubt it was discarded for use after that. You know, so it's a community privy. So I assume it was around for a little bit longer, but I would guess 50, 50 some years of use. And when did you dig? So the, the dig itself, I wasn't the digger. I was just the guy that the seeds. But the dig, so it's construction in 2000, 2021. So only two years ago. So it's a brand new unearthing. And they're still like discovering new finds. Uh, I just did the seed part, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I'm surprised you didn't find the wild plum and cherry. I agree. I was really expecting to see cherry, especially. Um, it is a very bitter fruit, however. 
And so mine just come down to personal preference. You know, it really just was his privy. He had some guests there, but it was at his residence. So it was really more what, what he ate or just what the settlers of the dead would ate, if that makes sense. They're in the back. Sorry. Yeah, I uh, excavated the previous, the uh, Cuyahoga gold mine, and I found a lot of corn cobs. Oh, uh, interesting. Did you find corn cobs in this one? Uh, none were given to me, I guess. I don't have a good answer to that. I wouldn't be surprised. There's definitely agriculture in that area. So just, the spearfish, spearfish used to be kind of like the farming community that kind of fed the like lean deadwood areas. Um, so I'm sure that's very true. But at the same time, though, corn cob, how old how was that period that you unearthed? Do you, do you know? Uh, it dated to um, at least 1902. 1902? That's pretty impressive that corn cobs lasted that long. I guess it, it must have been protected by the soil on top. Yeah, right. <laughs> that makes sense. Waste not one line. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Well, thanks for your time, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that ends our presentation for today. I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you all so very much for coming out. Don't forget to stop up at the museum this next